All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would like to get started. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the perils of LA traffic may have impacted a few arrivals, but being said, we have three distinguished panelists who are going to go ahead and give you an excellent panel today, and we would like to go ahead and feature that. And for those of you who are not aware of where you are, uh, welcome to the Milken Institute. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit economic think tank here in Santa Monica, and we are very glad to have you here. Uh, my name is Kevin Cloud, and I'm executive director of the California Center, and I have been thrilled by the partnership that we have had with KPCC for the past few years where we have delved into a number of key topics uh, affecting the Southern California economy, affecting its residents, affecting its workers, affecting its educators. And today we are in fact going to be focusing on the SoCal storylines revitalizing our cities, in particular dealing with the fact that the cities of which there are 88 in LA County, uh, one big one and a few smaller ones, uh, and I are the platform for many of the most important changes and the most important innovations that are happening here in Southern California, let alone in the entire country. And we are going today, we are gonna be addressing some issues that we consider very important here at the Milken Institute, issues of workforce readiness and what we call human capital, issues of infrastructure, issues of uh, economic development, issues of small business, issues of manufacturing. It is worth remembering that LA County is still the single largest center of manufacturing in the United States. And much of that manufacturing is in the hands of small and mid-sized businesses. But today we wanna say thank you to all, all of you for coming. Thanks to KPCC and Southern California Public Radio for this great partnership. And we're looking forward to having an excellent panel. And for that, I'm going to hand the mic over to John Cohn, who will introduce everybody so beautifully. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, on behalf of KPCC Southern California Public Radio, welcome to the Min Milken Institute. This is the second installment of our SoCal Storyline series and essentially the third season of collaborations that we've done with the Milken Institute's California Center. Uh, as Kevin alluded to, we've done a lot of regional issues, topics, conversations in a variety of different ways and we couldn't be happier with the partnership. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Kevin got to say all the fun, meaty, sort of wonderful stuff and I get to do the Ford promotion and housekeeping because that's my role in this partnership. Um, next installment is actually on November 16th. We'll be doing this third installment of SoCal Storylines looking at housing and infrastructure. That'll happen right here, so we encourage you to check that out. Um, all that fun housekeeping. You have devices. You're allowed to use them. We just ask you that you put them on silent and you not video, but feel free to take photos, do social media, and use the hashtag SoCal Storylines. We will be doing a Q&A at the end of the program. Uh, you raise your hand, a producer will come to you, say your name, where you're from, and your question, and we'll get to more people through more questions and have a more substantive sort of response during that portion of the program. And if you feel like, oh, I didn't quite get to the thing that I wanted to say or share, I do invite you to join us at Big Mike right over here after the, the series. That is our mobile recording booth. And we do excerpt uh, content that we collect at various in-person programs. Uh, and we share that across platforms. So we really, really, really do want to hear from you. Uh, being inclusive of voices from the community and around Southern California is a big part of our mission for, for KPCC. Um, so without further ado, uh, I, I've spoken too much, and we all know you did not come to hear from me. I would like to introduce you to KPCC reporter Ben Bergman. He's our senior reporter on the SoCal economy. Ben Bergman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much to uh, all of you for uh, coming out tonight. Really great panel, and I'm just going to uh, quickly introduce them. Uh, first of all, uh, Miguel Santana has been the Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Los Angeles since 2009. He reports directly to the Mayor and the City Council. He has direct oversight over the City's $8.1 billion budget. Thank you, Miguel Santana, for coming to Santa Monica. Uh, we have Asia Brown here. She has been the Mayor of Compton since 2013. When she was elected, it made national news. They call her 
the millennial mayor, because at 31, she was the youngest person ever to be elected mayor of Compton. Before that, she was an urban planner. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have Madeline Janis. She's the co-founder of Lane. It's the Los Angeles Alliance for the New Economy. Over the last two decades plus, it's been one of the most powerful groups in LA politics. In 2013, she started another group called Jobs to Move America, which advocates for transit manufacturing jobs. The public television host Bill Moyers said to Janice a few years ago, I don't know anyone who has won more organizing victories than you. We are honored to have you here with us as well, Madeline. All right, so uh, great panel tonight for SoCal Storylines and thanks a lot to the Milken Institute for having us here in Santa Monica. It's a really great partnership with KPCC and the Milken Institute um, and happy to have all of you here on this stage. And so um, we're gonna start with you, Miguel. Uh, you became Chief Administrative Officer in 2009, as I said, in the midst of uh, some financial difficulties everywhere, the Great Recession. Um, how big was the city's deficit when you signed on to take the job? How big was it when I was asked to take the job or actually <laughs> took the job? Well, both. <laughs> <laughs> there were two different numbers. Um, so I, I, I started in, um, in July of 2009, which is was probably the worst uh, economic crisis uh, since the Great Depression, uh, not only in the city, but at the national level and the global level. And um, the city uh, had just adopted a budget. Uh, the budget at the time was about six to seven billion dollars. And uh, it knew it had about a $250 million hole that it had to address. And um, I was the, the new kid. Um, spent most of my career up the street in the county um, and was in the center working with the mayor and the council and with our labor partners to really try to figure out how to manage this unprecedented challenge. Um, and as, as time progressed uh, during that first year, uh, we realized that we had, hadn't quite hit bottom yet. So what started off as a $250 million shortfall uh, ended up when all things were said and done in that fiscal year to almost half a billion. And, um, and it, was, um, it was a very difficult time. It was a really a time where the city had to fundamentally ask itself what is its fundamental core services. It had to uh, figure out how to manage um, uh, a, a crisis in the short term but really take a step back at the same time to figure out what were some of the systemic structural um, issues that sort of made this problem worse. Because while certainly we were confronted with a global economic recession that obviously we didn't control, there were certain things that were fundamentally uh, in the way the city was financed that created some of these challenges. So, and then that would be mainly pensions. Well, pensions being not all of it, part of it, but beyond that, um, just um, in, in the breadth of services that we provide and how we provide those services um, in, in deciding sort of our, our, who our vendors are and our contracts. Uh, it was a very uh, significant sort of process that where, where pensions were a part of but it started with asking a very fundamental question that I think a lot of cities ask is ultimately what is the job of a city? You know, uh, we, there's, a, there's a perception that cities can do everything and the crisis really forced uh, a reflection to think about what is our primary responsibilities and find other ways of delivering the kind of services that Angelinos expect but in a way that is perhaps more cost effective and so there was, it launched a five-year plan to sort of restore services and, and to ultimately stabilize our finances that included support from the public. And as you know, we, we unsuccessfully uh, sought an increase in our sales tax to help mitigate some of that shortfall and, and weren't able to do it, which prompted us to tighten our belts even more. And so what did you decide was not the essential function of the LA government? 
Well, it wasn't my decision to make. It was really sort of the policymaker's decision. I, I, I'm in the persuasion business. It's my job to, to identify the issues, present those issues, lay out the facts uh, to help facilitate decision making. And ultimately, the mayor and the city council had to make those decisions. But what, what, what was decided is our fundamental job is public safety. And the, the tension behind, at the time, there was a commitment that Mayor Villaraigosa had made to hire and maintain a police force of 10,000 officers. And most cities around the country stopped hiring officers during the crisis. That was one of the first things many cities did was to uh, stop hiring. If you, you know, the theory is if you can't afford the, the workforce you have now, you shouldn't be adding to it. Uh, Mayor Villaraigosa and the council after a very you know, uh, significant debate, made the decision that public safety is the most important function above everything else. And so even during the crisis, we continue to hire police officers and maintain a workforce of 10,000. Um, in retrospect, you know, it was a very tough decision because that meant we paved less streets, we trim less trees. In fact, we stopped trimming trees for a period of time altogether. Uh, there were real significant consequences to that. Um, and, but the decision to maintain the workforce of 10,000 officers was centered around this idea that if you don't have a safe Los Angeles, then it, it's hard to recover from an economic standpoint. It's hard to make uh, the kind of investments that you want to make and so that was the policy decision that was made. It was that it was my job to make sure that we were honest about the trade-offs associated with that decision. Madeline, do you want to jump in? Did they make the right decision? Well, I, I think that under the circumstances, you know, Miguel and the mayor and the city council did, you know, did a good job. I think the real problem is the narrative we got stuck with, which is that you know, government has limited function. And that really, it's everything's better done by the private sector. Really, it's the consequence of a 30-year attack by the right on public purpose and the whole idea of government. And so, you know, why? I mean, in my view, why should public safety? And public safety is important, but why should that be more important than education, or or uh, training, or parks, or bridges, or transportation? All of those things are, or the quality of our air. Uh, all of those things are really an essential public purpose, and I think one thing that hopefully we're starting to recapture in, in many ways in Southern California with many great leaders is that government has an important role to play as you know the purveyor of, of a good life. Well, and you probably wouldn't disagree with that, but you were looking at a limited budget and had to cut something. Well, I think that the interesting thing to me was that you started with wasn't this about public pensions? And that's how the narrative got turned, because you're looking at from a, from a point of scarcity, you're thinking, okay, here's, you know, taking care of our workers is the real problem when it's, you know, it's the lack of funding for government. Well, but I also say that because about half of the budget is that structural uh, pensions. I mean, there's nothing that the council can do, and very little, it's, it's like about 10% that's actually public works, correct? Well, twenty percent of it goes to pensions uh, of, our, of our general fund uh, to cover pensions, um, and that's probably what it is in most cities. Whether you're the size of L.A. or or size of Santa Monica or Compton, I mean, it's that's. I think what happened during that time, why pensions became the focal point, is that um, two things happened at the same time. The global recession created a, a crisis in the stock market, and so. Our pensions are reliant on a rate of return to help, uh, you know, maximize the investment made by the workers who pay for their pensions and the employer who also makes a contribution. The third piece is the investment associated with that. So, with the crash of the stock market, meant that we experienced unprecedented losses in our pension funds. So, bec the way public pensions work is that when there's losses the government makes up the difference. And so it's different from a, from a private 401k where if there's losses to your 401k, then you as the, the owner of that benefit 
uh, have to make up the difference or have to wait in time for the economy to recover. In the, our case, we have to pay, make a payment. So at the same time that our revenues were declining, our pension costs grew because of things that we don't control, which is the global economy. And so pensions became a focal point in part to the circumstances that we were confronting. Um, and so it, it prompted a much larger conversation about what to do to maintain a sustainable pension system, which is not unique to Los Angeles, but you know, as we recently read in the LA Times, the state has certainly just t uh, has had that conversation. But every major city, every major government, school district has had to confront this issue. And most of it, frankly, are things that, that you know, we can't control. Uh, you know, there's <coughs> pensions are often defined as, as villains, right? There's the, it's, it's a way of villainizing a, a workforce for receiving something that was promised to them. Um, when in fact, the part of the reasons our pensions have been challenged are number one, they were created at a time where we weren't anticipating that human beings will live as long as they live. I mean, this is the longest we have ever lived. <laughs> and, so, and so when you retire at age 65, you still hopefully will have another 20, 30 years of life to experience. Well, our pensions were established at a time where people didn't live that long, right? This is un, sort of unprecedented history. We don't control the stock market, you know? So there's, there's things that are beyond our control that, that, that are impact um, our pension system. Well, Mayor Brown, I want to bring you in because when you walked into <coughs> office in 2013, you also were facing a deficit and Compton, obviously, a very different city than Los Angeles. But what did you d decide was the essential part of government that you should focus on? You actually focused on 12 things. <laughs> um, we had 12 different areas that are quality of life indicators that were really um, at the key of our administration. But in terms of what we dealt with with the city is just basic service provision. Um, and as Miguel said, the core function of government at the end of the day, people pay taxes for services in exchange. And so they pay taxes because they want their trees trimmed and they want their streets paved and they want lighting, they want public safety, they want all these things that um, they should get in exchange for their taxes. And so in Compton, we really, because in similar just to LA and all other cities really, because of the crash in 2009, um, in 2011, our workforce was drastically reduced um, in order to um, meet the budgetary cuts that we needed to um, try to have a, a structurally balanced budget, operating budget. But um, on day one, we had $43 million deficit. We had, um, our credit rating had been um, revoked. We had um, increased costs with everything. And also we had an aging infrastructure. Most people don't recognize that Compton is 127 years old. And so our streets, our sewers, um, everything was in need of repair. And so with rising costs of everything, of materials, construction costs, um, supplies and also fortunately we didn't have our pension costs that we had to cover with our general fund because the voters in the city of Compton voted to actually pay for pensions out of their property taxes. And so pensions were secure um, and then also in Compton we used to have our own police force and it was disbanded in the early 90s and so we are now actually as of next year we'll be completing our payments for our Compton PD um, pensions and so we'll actually have a reduced pension demand but we were faced with um, the dissolution of redevelopment, which also heavily impacted our general fund um, in a significant way. And just to give an idea, Compton's um, annual budget, not including our water department, is about $55 million. Including our water department, we're about $150 million. But um, and to have a $43 million deficit that was accumulated within six years of just pure overspending by a former administration. They had um, parties and events and all these things that are just ridiculous. But um, we were faced with these significant costs and then also having to really think about the hurdles that we're going to have to um, plan for in the future, such as our, our infrastructure. And so um, there was a, a huge demand on um, our resources. And so we really had to get back to basics and think about um, what we were responsible for as a, as a government. Um, as an urban planner, I think of everything as a full system. And so, I, I focus within my office to really supplement um, what the city should be doing and um, what, what I believe that we should be doing in order to meet the needs of our residents. 
every community is different like a fingerprint. And so I look at what my community needs in order to have a quality of, of life and a healthy well-being. And it's different from any other city. And so um, we're looking at how do we create that, sh meet that shortfall and also leverage our additional resources. But um, it's, it's difficult because um, you want to be able to provide a, a good quality of life, good basic services, but with the increase in cost and demand and also um, just with the changing factors that you don't control, um, it, it makes it extremely difficult. Well, I'm just curious that you ran an, on, on 12 things because it seems like most cities like LA right now are trying to really focus on one or maybe two things. And you have a website where you can go see all the 12 priorities. Um, so, I mean, is that too many things to focus on or, or do you think that you can actually accomplish all 12? I think if you talk to my, my team, they will say absolutely, but um, we focus on um, everything really um, in a really strategic way and they aren't um, really monumental things. Some of them are just transparency and so we've implemented additional policies that would um, eliminate the ability to spend ourselves into such a significant deficit. Um, some of them were focused on economic development, so we've implemented policies with the city that enforce community benefits agreements for new development agreements. And so a developer could promise 35% local jobs, but with our policy, in, or, in order for them to get their entitlements, they actually have to sign a legal document as part of the development agreement to provide those jobs and training and the things that actually make these things happen. So um, many of them are policy-based, but some of them um, were really focused on um, quality of life, like public safety, um, improving um, youth development and different things that are just um, really about families, neighborhoods, so really simple things, but um, we've been able to be successful with our the work that we've been doing and really be able to get the additional support. And I can say that it's very beneficial to lay out what you would like to do because there are people that are like-minded and that have resources and that want to partner around those things. And so everything that we've done really has been as a result of partnership, everything. We haven't relied on our general fund to implement our programs. Um, to really attract ad additional investment. So it, it really helps to lay out what you um, are planning to do so that people that have um, the resources or the relationships or even just in-kind resources can help provide and galvanize around that strategy. So I found that to be a benefit. Well, and you just had a big success. You got UPS to open up a package delivery yes. center yes. in your city. You got them to agree to hire uh, a third of the workers will be from Compton. So yes. how did you do that? Economic development uh, does not change. I think that um, because of Compton's amazing location advantage, also we, um, they, they actually located to a brand new industrial facility. It's LEED certified, beautiful facility, um, 500,000 square feet in an industrial park. Totally it'll be a million square feet, but um, they're surrounded by four freeways, light rail, heavy rail, and with the city providing um, training for their workforce, that's an added benefit. And then also we provided 30% um, tax abatements for the future um, to be able to help offset some of their initial startup costs and to um, really get their return on investment in, in an area that they were comfortable with. Well, you are very good <laughs> at attracting press attention. And one of the things that attracted a lot of headlines from all over the world was when you said you wanted Compton to be a new Brooklyn. Um, so, I mean, A, do you think that can happen? And B, is that really what you want to have happen? Well, I'll say A, um, that was like the biggest misquote of my lifetime. Um, I, I never said that. Um, it was, <laughs> the question was asked to me, do I believe that Compton can turn around? And I said, absolutely. Um, you can look at Brooklyn and see that a city that had a similar reputation, similar issues um, with the crack epidemic in the 80s and really even the similar size and scale that, and even a community of color, that it can transcend its issues and evolve. And um, that was really the connotation. I'm, as a planner, I'm always cognizant of gentrification and the exclusivity of wealth and um, upward mobility. And so the kind of Brooklyn effect, I think, left a lot of people in the margins. Um, and so that's something that I do not want to duplicate in Compton, which we are very strategic and being inclusive within our policies to make sure that local people are a part of our, our growth and our um, development. And also that we're not just looking at jobs, but we're looking at small business development and incubation and making certain that we can um, connect our smaller corporations, excuse me, smaller businesses to our large development, which we're doing with Walmart. And so there are um, great opportunities to really be inclusive. And I think that 
there have just been times where um, because of the excitement or the opportunity that um, policymakers have missed the mark to make certain that the local community was a part of that. And so, and it goes all the way to housing, um, transportation, all of those things. And so it, it's really a policy decision. Mm -hmm. Well, Miguel, I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say well, you know, one of the biggest issues right now in LA is uh, affordability. LA is the most unaffordable city in the nation and housing just keeps getting more expensive. And uh, what do you think the city uh, can do about that? Well, the city has brought focus to that issue. I think it's whether um, you're a working family that's trying to make ends meet uh, with your kids or you're a recent graduate from college who's simply trying to find an apartment to live in. I think m many Angelinos, if not most, feel somewhat insecure about the housing situation. You know, I, I four m millennial daughters, I worry about them being able to find a home and to buy a home one day, if that's what they choose to do. Um, and so it is, if you see many, many polls place the, the, the housing crisis as one of the top issues that people think about, as well as the, the consequences of that, including homelessness. And so what the city's trying to do is really engage in this issue, in this approach from a multiple perspectives. The first is obviously um, helping uh, families uh, increase their, their wages by supporting the increase in the minimum wage. I mean, the city was one of the first major cities in the country, if not the first, to adopt a, a, an aggressive minimum wage increase to $15 an hour. And um, the idea is that as more families are able to afford it, then, then it helps mitigate the cost. The second is for the city to do a much better job in facilitating the development of housing by making it much easier and much more simplified and, and streamlining the processes for, um, for development and um, both investing in general plans as well as creating uh, red teams of, of you know, the various departments, building safety planning and others to, uh, to fast forward the development of affordable housing. So specifically, one of the things that we're, two things that we're doing now is um, uh, to address homelessness, you know, for the first time, there's actually a comprehensive strategy around homelessness that was done in coordination with the County of Los Angeles. And homelessness is particularly complicated because the city's responsible for sort of the crisis on the street, providing housing, uh, but the county provides the services. So you can't address homelessness unless there's coordination between the two. And oftentimes, the, when the city and the county was asked who's responsible for homelessness, they would point at each other. Uh, we currently saw that it going on between the city of Santa Ana and Orange County in their very own civic center, if you read, read the LA Times about that. We've, you know, the city and the county has changed that under the, the leadership of the council, the mayor, and the board of supervisors. There's been a real effort to coordinate strategies. The city adopted 64 strategies to deal with the immediate crisis, but also the long, the long-term solution, and obviously housing at the center of it. You know, the very definition of homelessness is to be without a home, and so you can't solve homelessness unless you uh, create housing. And so one way we're doing that is that we're making our own assets available. We, uh, we identified, we, the city owns thousands of parcels of land all over the city. Many of them are underutilized. Many of them are actually uh, creating blight in the community because the community is, um, it's inconsistent with the dominant use in that area. So we identified 12 parcels throughout in the west side and northeast LA and the east side and south Los Angeles and ask the private sector, nonprofit developers and others, would you be interested in building affordable housing and permanent supportive housing on these parcels for development as, as a way of testing this idea that there actually is a market. Um, my office is, is leading that effort and the RFPs or the proposals were due last week and we got 50 responses for 12 parcels of land with over 73 different concepts and so there clearly is a tremendous amount of interest among the private sector, among nonprofit developers to build affordable housing and permanent supportive housing for, 
for our, our neediest uh, Angelenos. And so um, to support that effort, the city has placed on the ballot, I know we're in the city of Santa Monica, but in the city of Los Angeles, if you're in, uh, listening from the city, you'll have on the no murder ballot a ballot measure that would allow us to issue $1.2 billion worth of bonds for permanent supportive housing. And th those bonds would be leveraged um, three to one with federal, state, and other uh, private investment and philanthropy to build ultimately 10,000 units of, of permanent supportive housing to house our homeless. We have well over 46,000 homeless people in the county of Los Angeles, uh, about 28,000 just in the city. And so clearly this is an issue that needs to be addressed in one form. So the city is doing a number of efforts. It's not, um, it's it like like many issues. There isn't an easy answer. There isn't one panacea that you could turn to and say, "Okay, if I, I just do that," we have to approach it on a number of fronts. You know, reducing the the risk of homelessness by helping raise wages so that working families have the ability to afford housing, streamlining our own processes so that folks who are interested in developing housing can do it, but also creating the spaces where housing could be built. How much of a connection is there between, you know, people like your kids trying to find housing that is affordable so maybe they don't move to an, another city like we're seeing a lot of people doing um, versus, you know, the, the homeless problem and, and how much will, as much as it will help, uh, you know, 10,000 units for, for the most um, vulnerable homeless people, you know, how much will that do for the greater problem? I mean, can we build our way out of this? affordability crisis? Well, I think ultimately that's the solution. And, you know, one of the, the secondary issues that are surfacing is really sort of a more fundamental question about what kind of Los Angeles do we want to be? You know, I think it's, I was born in Los Angeles. I've been here most of my life. Um, and there's, there's a vision of what Los Angeles was in the 1970s what, that I grew up in that's very different from the kind of LA that my kids are experiencing, right? And, you know. Um, How so? In, 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 a, in a city that's much more dense, right? Is, is the dream to, to be an Angelino, to have a suburban house with two, you know, car garage, a pool, and citrus trees, right? Is that what most people want now, you know? Or th and we, there's not enough space for everybody to have that. And if, if, if we're going to be able to, we're, you know, this is a problem that many of my colleagues around the country would love to have that are experiencing a decline in the population, you know, in the Rust Belt and other parts of the country. The numbers are actually declining. And people still want to come to Los Angeles, both from other countries, but also from the U.S. Families are choosing to be here, and so our population continues to grow. And the, and the less we allow density to be part of the answer, strategically, but along rail lines around um, commercial districts in a manageable way, the harder it's going to be to afford to live here. And so that's, that's really sort of one of the fundamental questions that I think Angelinos are asking themselves about what kind of Los Angeles are we going to be. I mean, I grew up watching the, the first skyscraper go up in downtown, right, from the roof of my house on the east side. And now, you know, it's a very different downtown. Right, and so now I live in downtown. So it's it's a very it's it's, a, it's one of the most amazing things about this city and this region is that it's constantly changing and reinventing itself. And I think that we're going through that period now. Well, and, and voters will have a chance to answer that yeah. because there is another ballot measure that's coming out next spring that would actually put a two-year moratorium on uh, on uh, developments that that don't uh, adhere to the city's zoning code. That's right. Um, well, Madeline, I want to bring you back in because Miguel mentioned minimum wage. And um, I'm curious what you think because, you know, you were behind the living wage ordinance in the 80s. which 90s. The 90s, sorry. And, um, you know, are, I guess, are you surprised that we have a $15 minimum wage, that it has spread so quickly? Because you now have not only L.A., Seattle, San Francisco, but also California and New York. And I say quickly because it was only less than three years ago that the first city in the US, SeaTac, right outside of Seattle, passed a $15 minimum wage. And now you have 
big states doing it. Are, are you surprised that it's happened this quickly? I think it's exciting. I do think, I remember back in the 80s and 90s, um, those of us that were around then, um, that you know, people living in poverty all over the place, and a lot, most of those people were actually working, and that you know, it was, this was a rage boiling up. And I remember in the civil unrest in 1992, and I was raising my kids. I was living in South LA, and you know, buildings burned all around us. And my kids, you know, drew pictures of build, uh, burning buildings. And I remember watching, you know, the moms, you know, grabbing boxes of Pampers and and you know things that they desperately needed and couldn't afford. And so it doesn't surprise me that there's a lot of fervor, you know, and a lot of support. But I also think that. There's been an inspiration and a lot of investment from the Service, Work, Service Employees International Union and from many people in these regions fighting really hard. And then workers, you know, fast food workers, hospital workers, hotel workers, standing up and talking about what it's like to live on $9 an hour, $8 an hour. It's really, it's a, it's a desperate life. I mean, it's a life of no bed or you know, no privacy and you know, hours and hours in transportation and not enough food and bad food and all those things and affecting so many of our people. So $15 minimum wage, you know, still, if we think about it, $15, which we're not going to be at for a few years, is still not really, really not enough to live on, but at least it gets people to a place where they can live in some dignity. I, you know, I think it's the, com you know, the comprehensive program that Miguel was articulating and that you know, Brown was talking about um, building in Compton. It's, it's uh, affordable housing, it's you know, good jobs, it's, it's career path and opportunity for people who have been historically excluded, women, people of color. Um, it's a good quality of life in parks and, and you know, all of that I think requires a very active and high functioning government. And I think that's what's important and remarkable about Los Angeles in many ways because we have an effect kind of reinvented a government that's for the people, by the people, and that's really trying to do things more comprehensively. Well, and, and the government of LA and of California is so much more liberal than when you started Lane, and you have the possibility of the first liberal supermajority on the Board of Supervisors in modern history. So uh, you know, how does that change the calculation for progressives and, and what they can get accomplished? One of the things that I've thought a lot about in my transition over the last five years, and I've gone from, from helping to start and leading a very a strong regional organization to thinking about national and global work, is that there's a lot we can do with local government, uh, a lot we can, even more we can do with state government, um, but again, we're in a globalized economy. Most of the, the big companies doing business now in the US are global companies. Uh, I'm working a lot in the transportation field where we look at our buses, our trains, our, all of the equipment that we buy. It's almost all made overseas and it's made by global companies. And it, it's, it's, we still have a kind of shrinking violet approach to government when it comes to the private sector. And you know, this, this reticence to regulate. Regulation is good. Regulation is the rules of the road. You know, that's what we all have to you know, follow when we go drive to work. And uh, so I think, you know, LA and California working together and the federal government as well can uh, really reinvent um, how do we create the rules of the road for an, an economy that works for everyone. Hmm. And that's what I think the important thing. Lesson, you know, the birthplace, the modern birthplace of that idea, I believe, is LA. How far do you think that the minimum, the $15 minimum wage will spread? Because we've seen it spread very quickly, as I mentioned but those have mostly been northern, fairly liberal places. We have yet to see it go to the, the south. Do you think it's gonna be sort of like, you know, it's been, com been compared to the movement for gay marriage in a way that it, it, it spreads quickly. Do you think it's like that and we'll see it uh, pretty soon in, in the south or is it kind of spread as far as it's going to for the time being? Well, I don't think anything spreads like, you know, kind of amorphously, you, you have to really look at, it, it comes down to people and politics. And we have kind of a lockjaw of the right-wing 
polish, you know, right-wing politics in a lot of the southern states and a lot of even the Midwestern states, you see cities throughout the South really trying hard to pass minimum wage or living wage or really innovative policies, and then you have the state governments coming down. Look at the city of Cleveland. The city of Cleveland passed just an, a, a logical, real, you know, um, realistic local hire program, just like the one in Compton and many other places. When we're putting city money in projects in Cleveland, then we want a percentage of the jobs to go to local folks. And the state governor and the government um, passed a, what's called a preemption law to prohibit the local hire from being implemented in the city of Cleveland. Basically preempt everything that local governments could do. So I think that's where the fight is throughout the country. Right now it's to stop this state preemption, which is kind of the opposite in many ways of what the right wing has stood for, which is you know, let's push it down, let's have local control, let's not have big government. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to this kind of thing, you have, you know, the state of Georgia, you have the state of Louisiana, the state of Ohio clamping down. So that's going to be the thing, you know, do we see, what kind of changes do we see in our national politics? And can we see local state governments um, being, becoming more progressive so that uh, low-wage workers and communities and unions and as many stakeholders can pass minimum wage and affordable housing and local hire. Hmm. Mikhail, you have a, an interesting role as the chief administrative officer because you have been fairly out there. Uh, you, you have been very out in front on the homeless issue. You work for the mayor and the city council, but you also at times come out and uh, challenge them. And I think back to last summer when the mayor and the city council were very much going forward with the Olympic bid, and you put out a report that really put the brakes on that. What do you see your role as, as the chief administrative officer? Well, this, the position of the CAO is in the charter. So in the, in the charter, when the, when the uh, thinkers and the writers of the charter established the office, um, the intention, I think, was to have a place in city government that Angelinos, elected officials, investors, bond rating agencies, labor, other stakeholders could go to to simply get a, a understanding of the of the facts of the, of where things are, uh, sort of separate and apart from whatever politics are occurring. And um, that's a you know I'm one person in an office of 140 people who feel very strongly in that mission. Is, it's, it, it predates me, you know, I've, whether it was Keith Comrie or Bill Fujioka or so many others before, there's a strong belief that there should be a place in government that, that um, provides objective uh, analysis to issues. And, and it's the one, p off one, there's a handful of positions that report both to the mayor and the council um, for that reason. And I work very closely with the chief legislative analyst who reports to the council. I work very closely with the mayor's office. I mean, just the budget itself is sort of an odd thing. So when the budget is released on April 20th, it's actually prescribed in the, in the, the charter as when it should be released. It's the mayor's budget. It reflects his perspective. It, ref, it, it reflects his priorities. But it's actually put together by my office. So my office puts together the budget uh, drafts it, we advise the mayor as to what to put in the budget. And then the day the budget gets released, uh, I, I change hats and then present that budget to the council and share with them my perspective on the mayor's budget, whether we agree with it or not. So, and we know what's in it because we actually wrote it, <laughs> and, and, but it reflects his priority. So it's this interesting dynamic. And, um, and I, so I think it's, you know, regardless of who sits in this job, whether it's me or somebody else, that mission stays intact. It's an office that believes that, and that uh, it has that responsibility. You know, part of our job is that we issue the debt for the city. And, you know, I, I spent two weeks out of the year meeting with investors, with the bond rating agencies, and my obligation to them is actually established by federal law. It'll be by the Security Exchange Commission. It's my lawful uh, requirement 
to tell them the state of the, our city, the city's finances, the good, bad, and the ugly. And I could get in a lot of trouble if I don't do that because I'm asking investors to invest in us. And so they need to know where, where the revenue and the expenditures match up, not just today, but in the future and what our real liabilities are. And so th those are responsibilities that, that are not dependent on one person is really about um, the mission. And beyond that, I think there's also a responsibility to be a problem solver, is to allow you know, the mayor and the council set the agenda. They, they are elected by the people to represent them and the issues that they most care about. And it's our role to help, help them think about the ways to approach those problems, uh, whether it's homelessness or dealing with a fiscal crisis or fis fixing our sidewalks or long-term plans for our roads or you know, how we manage our animal services department. Um, it's, it's really to provide that point of view. When we're asked, and in the charter it's also clear when we're not asked. You know, we're, 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 it's clear in the charter that it's expected that the CAO will provide a perspective even when no one wants to hear it. <laughs> and that was kind of the case with the Olympics? Well, with the Olympics, it was, you know, it, it, it was really to put in, in, you know, doing a partnership with the city attorney and with the chief legislative analyst is to make sure that the mayor and the council understood what we were getting into, right? What commitment were we making? Uh, and, and not to put a kibosh on it, but to say, if we're going to make this commitment, uh, what are the steps that could be taken to ensure that we're minimizing our risk and uh, improving um, the likelihood of a successful outcome, which is ultimately what everybody wants to see. So, you know, how do we think about where to put an Olympic village and what the true cost of that would be? Um, um, what are we guaranteeing if, if there are shortfalls, as we've seen virtually in every other Olympics with the exception of Los Angeles in 84, who covers that cost? And how do we uh, ensure that we minimize our vulnerability around those things? So it's, it was our job not to say the Olympics are a good thing or a bad thing, but rather to say these are the risks that we see and, these are, and this is the advice that we give you to minimize those risks. And fortunately, both the mayor and the council agreed, yeah, we should do those things. And in fact, we are doing those things. And we have a, we're fortunate to have a partner through LA24 that has really taken as part of its mission and purpose to ensure that not only does the city get the Olympics, but it actually demonstrates that it can do it without putting our finances at risk at the same time creating a new generation, a new investment in the city like 84 did. How is it different working for Mayor Garcetti versus Mayor Villaraigosa? You know, I get asked that question all the time and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. And of course I've known both um, for a significant amount of time. The interesting thing uh, is um, they approach problems and issues in a very different way. I think um, uh, Mayor Villaraigosa uh, has, uh, comes to an issue from a very uh, clear point of view. Uh, he has an, an intuition that he relies on. He has a, uh, a, f a context in which he looks at a number of issues. Um, Mayor Garcetti shares that, but he, th he, th he reads everything. He, he's very intensely involved in trying to understand it from a policy standpoint. And while they may approach an initial set of problems in a different way, it's been my experience at least, both when uh, then uh, Council President Garcetti and Mayor Vietagosa work together, that they, they usually end up in the same place. And so, um, you know, it's like working with any two different people, you know, every, we're all products of our background, of our history, of our, you know, our, our, our education and other things. But I think the, it's the outcome that I think really defines uh, who they are in many ways. And, and I haven't really s seen too many differences. I mean, Mayor Garcetti now strongly supports maintaining 10,000 officers. You know, it was a commitment that was made by Baron Villaraigosa. He's continued that. And uh, Mayor Garcetti now is very, is, 
has, he cares about making sure that we're not just balanced today, but that we have a balance for the next several years. And so making decisions that would be seen as more fiscally conservative um, is, is, is to ensure that we're, we're, we're not confronted with the same challenges later. And, um, you know, the city adopted pension reform under Mayor Villarregosa, but uh, settled in a lawsuit on the same set of issues under Mayor Garcetti. And so, uh, you know, there was a labor contract um, with uh, the DWP union that was started under Mayor Villarregosa and ended under Mayor Garcetti that resulted in three years of no raises, a new pension tier, and the resolution of litigation. So there's, so there's actually, the outcomes are actually very similar. Uh, mayor Brown, you know, a, a lot has been made, at least in the press, of you being the millennial mayor. Um, so I'm curious, as a f fellow millennial, at least an old millennial, how you think that um, being, you know, younger has has helped you in your job, um, and also maybe are you know are there points at which it's it's been a challenge? It's made certain things harder. Um, definitely, I think um, being younger, I, I have a different perspective on how to address some of the systematic issues um, that have been encompassing for a long time. I think it also gives me a different um, amount of optimism about what is possible to change and what is not possible to change. Um, I think that it has been um, also just with my, my background in policy and urban planning, I think that that has been extremely beneficial to just implement some basic um, and strategic systematic changes that really needed to be addressed and to really kind of troubleshoot what the core issues are for the city in order to get it on the right track in the future. Um, challenges, um, they, they've been many. Um, <laughs> I definitely would say that people um, in general, especially, I'll start with the community. The community is just really, um, they've been really supportive and I think that they're very supportive of um, young people stepping into leadership. Um, but they definitely will have a scrutinizing eye as to um, your experience, um, what you've accomplished in your career. And um, thankfully, I've actually worked in cities for a long time, well, over a decade before I became mayor and can point to some tangible projects that are actually up and running in my city today. So that gave me the credibility. But there's definitely the additional level of scrutiny um, in terms of working with existing or older um, elected officials. I think that there are two different types of um, elected officials. You have your um, policymaker and public servant, and then you have your just strong politician. And um, there are people that are just highly political and they use every single issue or item to make a, a political play. Um, and then there are people that are just really interested in progress and service and outcomes. And so I think that um, there's usually an old guard in most smaller cities and so I've definitely come up against the old guard and they're invested to keeping things the same. And so I think any new idea is almost an indictment to what didn't happen or should have happened or has not happened. And so um, people take things really personal, um, but I think that being um, younger, it gives me that resiliency that I need. Um, and I think if I didn't have it, I probably wouldn't still be here um, or even <laughs> be pondering another run at this. But um, I think that it's, it, it definitely comes with its advantages and um, drawbacks, but um, either way, I think it's, um, it was what was needed for the time in Compton. So what was something that you hoped to be able to solve, but then you found out it just couldn't be? Um, one of the things was um, we are in desperate need of charter reforms, and I had introduced a, um, a, a salary reform package to my council, and they just didn't want it. And then, um, <laughs> and I had talked about it for two and a half years, and I told them it was coming, and I was working on it, and I gave everybody a heads up that you know this is going to happen, and um, they didn't want it at all. And about two weeks later, the um, district attorney's office stepped in and said, well, I think you guys should have some salary reform. And they could just swore that I did that, but I didn't. Um, and so our salaries were reformed in an ex extreme way, but it was something that was just necessary. And I think that it's about efficiency, um, really about um, restoring public trust, and then also creating a pathway to um, really diversify the 
type of people that elect to go into public service, especially in small communities. It shouldn't just be about your compensation. It really should be about what can you bring to the table, what resources can you bring, what relationships, um, strategic partnerships, and really be performance-based. And so um, that was really one of the things. Um, even performance-based budgeting was, we've been going, um, <laughs> it's been a struggle the last couple of years. And so I think that um, there is just an, a real need to have um, a, a new standard for um, elected officials, especially in local cities. Um, there's the, the old book, um, All Politics is Local. And I personally have not seen any more fierce politics than at the local level. And I think that it is really, um, it's really, it's not as, because it's not sophisticated or usually rooted in something um, that usually makes sense. Um, it's usually a feeling that it's just really hard to navigate because depending on the issue, the outcome is just really, um, it could be something that you cannot um, really calculate. And so those are just some of the challenges. Did you like uh, Straight Outta Compton? <laughs> I thought it was a good, it was a good movie. Um, I think it was nostalgic. I grew up um, obviously in the, the 90s. I remember the songs. My mother wouldn't let me listen to like 75% of them, so they were new to me, but um, I think it was really, <laughs> I think it was um, a great movie and really had a snapshot of Compton in the 90s. And so I think it also helped to um, really pique the interest of people, even in the investment community about, you know, what is Compton like today? And so we were able to really give um, a clear picture and really show them that the same level of homicides in the 90s or at the height of straight out of Compton, there were about 120 per year. And now we're averaging, um, in the last two years, we've had less than 30 um, per year on average. And so there's a significant difference. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and we're um, um, even working to get greater strides, but it, it's really about the big picture and really investing in people and not um, solely looking at institutions. And, and you know, this could have been something that kind of set your efforts back in terms of giving people an outdated image of the city, but you actually used hashtags and other means to use it to your advantage. Absolutely. Um, I've had conversations, even um, my husband, <laughs> we heard the movie was coming out and working with Universal. Um, people were really concerned, but I'm like, this is amazing, this is great, because this will, again, pique people's interest. And I think people are usually curious um, about things that are not necessarily a part of the status quo, so it was a great opportunity to say, well, guess what? The same Compton you saw in the 90s is not the Compton of today. And we were able to have people come in and, and visit and really drive the city, and they're just always shocked because it's nothing like we think it is. And there's new housing developments and mixed use, and. Um, significant investments, and so people are always astonished. So it, it was a great opportunity for the city. Madeline, I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, something you're working on now, which is Measure M. You described this to me when we spoke before as sort of a, a one-time shot for the city, this huge amount that will be spent on transportation. Uh, and this is, I know, something you feel passionately about. I do, I do feel passionately about Measure M. Measure M is a, a sales tax increase that will fund a, you know, 120 plus billion dollar investment in our county's uh, transportation infrastructure. And I'm one who really believes in triple bottom lines and intentional um, investment. So I think if we just did 120 billion and we <coughs> built some nice lines, um, that would be good, but I'm not sure it would be worth it. What I think the potential of Measure M is, and it's beginning to be achieved with Measure Measure R, we're starting to see all these new rail lines, um, but we're also starting to see good jobs and people in our communities in those jobs, an opportunity for training and apprenticeship, and then the opportunity to actually make the things that go into our transportation system right here um, in Southern California, or at least in, in the United States. And I think that's the promise that we ha have seen and that's the commitment we've seen from LA Metro and the mayor's office and uh, many other members uh, that this is going to be a, a great new deal for Los Angeles. That, we, that it's like the, the new deal in the 30s where we actually had investment, but investment that changed lives and investment that built communities 
and not only with good transportation and good quality of life, but with an incredible economic investment and fusion. So I, I am very excited about it. I also realize that there are deep issues about equity that have to do with both access to transportation and the quality of transportation and also access to the jobs, quality of the jobs. And I think those are the kinds of things we need to continue to fight for. And I, I know I'm gonna be there day after we win Measure M and vote yes on Measure M. Um, I'm gonna be fighting to make sure that it's invested equitably in Compton and in you know, our poorer parts of the county and in every part of the county. Well, we're gonna go to uh, questions in just a couple of minutes, but I wanna end this part of the program by asking each of you what you think is the biggest challenge, uh, in your case, for Los Angeles, Southern California, Compton. So um, let's start with you, Mayor Brown. What is the biggest challenge facing Compton right now? I would definitely say it's infrastructure. Um, our aging infrastructure is really impacting um, cities across the nation. And just speaking with mayors um, everywhere, the, the big question or the burden is how do we pay for the cost of our aging infrastructure in a government um, that is investing less in transportation? Um, and especially when transportation dollars are distributed from the federal level, they go directly to the state and they go to the county. So very little dollars actually go back directly to the cities. And um, in Compton, we just passed the sales tax measure, which I staunch advocate and um, really led the effort and against opposition of you know people that want things to be exactly the same. But the question is, um, how do we pay for a system that everyone uses, um, that benefits all, but also that the costs are gonna to continue to rise? And for instance, in Compton, we have 128 linear miles, but 99% of the infrastructure needed to be replaced because of obsolescence, also a lack of um, just general investment in maintenance. And so um, with our one cent sales tax measure that we passed, we'll be able to pave every single street in Compton, also add additional lighting, which we desperately need. Um, improve our parks and also maintain those investments. And the biggest thing in which I was able to advocate to our residents is that this is our own economic stimulus package. Regardless of what the outcomes are um, for the variety of measures or what the federal government does, we have an opportunity to pay for what we need in our city and you get to get a return on your investment dollar for dollar. Additionally, um, with all of the, with our local hiring policy, um, with the public project, those jobs are local. We also have an opportunity to stimulate our economy um, with our local businesses, our construction trades, and also making certain that we anticipate for this increased level of investment. And so we're working on creating our construction training programs now. We have apprenticeship programs. We're working with our building trades. So to get people ready for these huge opportunities because um, anyone that's ever dealt with um, development or even local hiring is that there's always the excuses that you don't have a skilled and qualified workforce. And so we're really um, being proactive and making certain that people are skilled and trained and ready to work. And so um, that, I think infrastructure will be the biggest issue um, and not just um, rail or just the mobility aspect, but just basic streets. Because regardless of the zip code, if you're in Beverly Hills or if you're in Compton, there are potholes in the city that have to be addressed. And so we're not just talking about today, but 30 years from now. And so um, I think infrastructure is going to be a, a huge threat to cities everywhere across the nation. Yeah, don't take Wilshire Boulevard if you're, <laughs> you're back downtown. <laughs> All right, uh, Madeline, what about you? I'm really torn and, you know, cause I, I have grandkids now and I think about my, the future, our future generations. Uh, on one hand, I think poverty is Poverty is not something that's kind of a little side problem. Poverty, poverty is endemic to Southern California and to the United States. And you know, we, we step over homeless people. And but there are also, you know, I've walked precincts many times and I've organized in communities. And you go, you know, in the back of every home is, you know, a family of eight or ten squeezed in and, you know, barely surviving. And the level of child poverty is, it's, it's. It's not just a pro you know, problem for a few, it's a problem for all of us. Um, and then I, I think, well, I am worried for my grandchildren about what climate change is, is doing to our planet and our future and you know, this horrible drought. Um, and I, you know, in the summer, waking up and my, you know, the world is orange and you know, what that means for us. And I think the combination of those two really are the epic challenges. And I think infrastructure is a way out of them and you know, putting our minds together and heads together to, 
to think about how we do both. But that's poverty and climate change. Piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What about you? What is, uh, I, I think I know what you're going to say is the biggest issue facing Los Angeles. Ew, that's, I, you know, actually, I, I agree with, with um, the mayor and that obviously infrastructure is a, a huge uh, problem for the city. It was kind of developed at the same time and it's falling apart at the same time. Uh, but I think even beyond that, it's something more fundamental. I think it's really about trying to figure out how do we how do we fashion an economy that actually helps everybody. And I think that's you, you. It may be surprising to hear that from a CAO of a city, but that really is the foundation of everything else. And, and it it re, it's reflected in our revenue in terms of how much revenue we receive. It's, it's reflected in in opportunities. That, that ensure uh, mobility for families. It, it's affected in our crime rates. It's, there's fundamentally the inequity that's occurring in not just in, around the country, but particularly in Los Angeles, is, is changing sort of the notion of what Los Angeles is, uh, where it's becoming more acceptable to see these differences in, in folks who are living in, incredibly um, privileged lifestyles right next to folks who are struggling just how to survive. And, you know, we're the epi epicenter of the working poor. This is where people actually work and are poor and, and, it's, and uh, have a strong work ethic who, who get up every morning trying to figure out how to provide for their families, and yet that's not enough. And so, and, and so there's, there's so many things that the city and the region can do to address it, a lot of them being led by my colleagues on the stage, but but I think we have a rare opportunity as a region, as a city, to figure those things out because it's it's not a partisan town. I mean, everybody's most people are blue, so it's not really about that. We have a, the state has sort of stabilized, it sort of has gotten its act together. Um, you know, it's we're in a very special bubble, if you will, that we could actually start taking on some of these issues. You know. I, I think about my own career at the city. I mean, it was really about figuring out how to survive another day. But we've gone so much beyond that now. It's really about figuring out how do we ensure a better quality of life for all Angelinos, which are the reasons why all of us are in public service. All right. Well, uh, with that, we can open it up to questions. And we have a couple uh, people here with microphones, so they're going to uh, come to you. Please uh, ask your questions. Uh, keep them brief. Please no statements. Ken Murray, uh, Studio City. Uh, Mayor, I, I find you to be a, an impressive professional. In Ben's a question to you about millennials, you mentioned your background and how that uh, helped you uh, with credibility. But I find that we seem to be in a political climate right now well, to take an example that the President of the United States, which has got to be somewhat more complicated than being mayor, <laughs> uh, is considered an entry-level job. And I'm wondering if you have some perspectives on that, being an executive yourself. Um, no, I don't. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I'm sorry. Um, All right, next question. <laughs> Uh, so this question is for Miguel. Hey, how you doing? Um, but maybe there's a way in for everybody up there. I've just really appreciated the discourse. It's really lovely to hear everybody's uh, opinions and unique perspectives. Um, uh, Miguel, I want to personally thank you for your advocacy for uh, the city's interest in attacking homelessness. I know that's something that you personally you know, went on the line for. I think it's beautiful. Um, I work with an organization, nonprofit organization called the Social Enterprise Alliance of LA. We're working on some social enterprise focused interventions in uh, downtown, particularly Skid Row. I feel like Skid Row is the great symbol for homelessness in LA, if not in all of America. And if we could do something about Skid Row, it, it would be a, be a victory beyond victory. Um, and in our own outreach in the community, um, we found that surely, like the need for affordable housing is big and important, um, but there's also so many social and emotional and trauma-based issues that if they're not addressed, it's almost like moot to have housing available. Mm -hmm. And uh, where I'm going with this is, 
you know, I'm a big believer in the idea that if you're going to try to affect change in the community or serve the community, you need to fold the voice of the community into the authorship of that change and service. Otherwise, it, it, isn't, it won't endure. It's not sustainable. And some of the vibe is that uh, what the city's interested in might be done at the community instead of with the community. And I guess I want to get your sense of what can be done to fold the voice of, uh, of the homeless, of those that we're seeking to serve, into, you know, in the planning, the development, and the implementation of some of uh, the change that we hope to affect in, these pr in, the, in, that, in the, those problems. Well, I, I think fundamentally that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. I mean, I I as, you, as you stated, you could, you could, the city or a private developer or a nonprofit developer could build uh, a unit of affordable housing but if it's not responsive to the community it seeks to serve, then it's not necessarily being helpful. And so uh, it has to be reflective of, of the community. And so fortunately, the way we're, we're approaching this, this issue is by really partnering with those organizations who do this every single day, who, who is, it's in their mission statement and in their purpose to to work with the homeless community, understand their issues, know that it's not one monolithic group. There, there are as many reasons why people end up being homeless as there are solutions to homelessness, and so um, and who have the the experience and the ability to respond effectively to those issues. It's, it's not, we're trying to avoid having it be an approach from the top down where it's government imposing a set of ideas uh, or, or approaches. We're, we're, we're practically approaching this more as a facilitator and, and an ability to fill in the gap. You know, um, people have been doing this work for a very long time, you know, and so we're, we're kind of the last ones to the party in terms of trying to figure it out. And the, the, the strategies around homelessness were really best informed around those individuals who, who do this work every single day. And so, um, and so what they shared was, don't replace what we do. We don't, we don't need you to be in the housing business from the standpoint of actually building the housing. We need you to help fill in the gaps. And so the housing bond came out of that concept. It wasn't, the, word, the ideas of this government building housing projects is a failed one. And there's examples all over the country in this city that we know it didn't work because it's not responsive. It's, it's treating a community as everyone requiring the same, the same space, the same experience, when in fact it's very different. Um, and so that, that is true not just for the homeless community, but frankly for the rest of the community who were asking to embrace the community. You know, one of uh, two, uh, last weekend, uh, Councilman Bonin and I uh, to, did, gave a bus tour of four housing developments in the community of Del Rey, not too far away from here. And there were, and there were unit developments that when originally presented were opposed by the community. They were saying, we don't want homeless housing here. You know, this is not what we see ourselves in. And developers came in, they presented a concept and listened very carefully to the neighborhood. You know, reduced the size, changed. And, and the most important thing that they did is they actually connected the face to the two faces, the face of the resident who lives next door and the person, the new resident who's going to be moving in to that unit. And then that those communities went from opposing it to supporting it, who are now advocates for it, who are actually saying, now sharing that experience to their neighbors in Venice, saying there's actually a way of doing this that actually improves your neighborhood. And because one way or the other, the homeless people are Angelinos like the rest of us, and they're your neighbors. They live outside, so you decide where they're going to live. So that's, th that's again, um, the way the city, the big aha moment for the city was to say, we should, our role is to help facilitate and support the work that's already being done rather than to replace it. Madeline, you wanted to jump in quickly? Yeah, I just, 
You know, I always like to reflect upon a little bit of history, which is that, you know, in the Great Depression, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected, he sat down with, you know, activist leaders, union leaders who had gotten him elected, and he said, now I agreed to this bold program, now make me do it. And, you know, I, I think back to my career, and, and I've spent a lot of time on the inside, 10 years on the city's redevelopment authority, and I'm sitting on a state commission now, and nothing, there's a lot of good people in government. And, you know, I think that the program that Miguel has articulated and Mayor Brown has articulated, and, you know, that I know a lot of great people in government, but it doesn't happen unless people are activated, educated, mobilized, involved, and unless there's tension. And, you know, it could be good tension, but unless you're pushing the city council um, and the city to do things, then the city is going to do probably the least of the hardest things. Um, and uh, just the last anecdote, uh, when I, when I um, my one time in my career, I worked at a very big law firm in the 1980s, and uh, I represented developers. And I would go down to City Hall, and this was the late 80s, um, and I would uh, see how things got done. And, you know, basically the developers and our, you know, we, we the lawyers, sorry, went up to the rope and we, you know, we made deals happen. And then the day of the vote, a lot of people would show up for that day, but the deal was already done. And so when I left that law firm and I went and, and create, helped to create Lane, my first order of business was to bring a thousand people to City Hall. And that's when we started organizing on the first living wage law and we, we had kids, we had senior citizens, we had all kinds of people getting involved in that first living wage law. And you know, we, we achieved a lot more than we thought we could. And, and I think member, people inside government who wanted to do good things felt like you're making it easier for me to do it. So that's, I mean, that's the thing, there's never an easy route. And the minute you think you're gonna take the easy route, which is talking and making, you know, making it happen without really involving people and being messy, then that's the date that you don't get as much as you could have. Um, Max Shorty, Watts, California, chairman of the Watts Neighborhood Council. How do we get underserved communities to believe in this infrastructure that we so, blat we so badly need without it leaving a bad taste in our mouth or empty pocket? Do you wanna take that one? Um, well, well, for us, I, I think our infrastructure measure is a different dynamic than Measure M, which is a regional measure. Um, and in contrast with Compton's measure, it was specifically a local tax measure that will be expended locally. And so um, there's citizen oversight, there's a process to identify what the priority projects were. Before we put the measure together, we did an extensive community survey to really identify what people wanted to spend their money on. And so, um, and even throughout the whole campaigning process, we had um, focus groups and worked with our community leaders, but the city in, was really united on what we wanted, which was our infrastructure, our streets done, we wanted um, lighting, we wanted parks, and also public safety. And so, and also there was a great interest on um, really providing funding for reentry. And so, those were the city's priorities. They spoke loud, loudly, um, and so we are charged with providing that spending plan and strategy to get that done. And so I think, um, and I'm not the expert on Measure M, I think that you'd be um, excellent now and talk about that, but I think it's um, something that is a need. And I think that there is a concerted effort to really incorporate what the benefits will be and really communicate that to everyone. And I think once, um, that is done in an effective way, then people will be able to um, really get behind it in a way that I think we'll see turn out at the polls, but if you don't mind kind of talking about Measure M. Well, I actually think that there's a three-part formula to making infrastructure deliver for real people. And you know, the, the three parts are, the first part is the money. So we have to vote for the money, allocate the money. The second part is the policy implementation so if we want to see equity, we want to see people on, from our communities on those jobs, we want to see things distributed well, we need to advocate for a policy that puts it in writing. 
And so I think that's, you know, oftentimes we go and we speak and we say, do this and we, you know, you know we, we need you to act. What we need is we need it in writing. And the third thing is we need transparency. So when those contracts are issued to those private companies to build those big projects, to build those trains, to do all those things, we need to be able to see what the deal was and we need to make sure they do it. And right now there's a big hole in what's called transparency laws or freedom of information. And that's this whole thing about trade secrets. And that's you know a whole other subject. But uh, basically, we need to make sure that it's information. So the money that put it in writing and transparency, and that is a recipe for real jobs and real opportunities. And I think always the, the when, because people want to know, well, when am I going to see these improvements? And so I think that that's. Um, a big issue with a lot of people because I think I've spoken with people on Measure M specifically and they don't mind paying but the, the question is always well when will we see these improvements and so I think that that has to be communicated in a way that's effective. If I, if I could also add I think a lot of it really starts w with the community and with the accountability at that level. You know the there was recently an article in the LA Times that that uh, did an analysis of which communities get their trash picked up faster, out, not just the one in Binge, but just the litter that's everywhere, right? And b it wasn't surprising that uh, poor communities got their, it, it took longer to pick up their trash than in wealthier communities. And there's a number of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that when people don't feel connected to their government and don't feel if they call their government something will happen, then they don't call. And so the government reacts to where people call. I mean, it, 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 this, you know, the analogy of the squeaky wheel really does apply in how resources are allocated because when you have scarcity, that's the way it's done. And it's not the appropriated way to do it. So we, we propose a proactive way of identifying and grading our streets to make sure that they're all clean. But one of the things when I worked at the county for a member of the Board of Supervisors, we spent a lot of work um, empowering the residents to hold us accountable to their own government so that they should expect that graffiti gets cleaned up and within 24 hours. They should expect that the when they call for an abandoned couch that it gets picked up within a time. And when it doesn't happen, to use their elected officials to make sure it does, to almost flood the system so that there's a conversation about what the resources will be needed to make sure that all communities get the base level of services, including infrastructure. Well, and, and I, I have to say, when I was doing the prep for this, I read an article about you where you were trying out my LA through on one, which is this great app where you can go and request services. So I had some graffiti in my neighborhood and I went on the app and requested it. And I requested it in the afternoon. The very next morning, it was gone. <laughs> it was like magic. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. like, That's you know, great. try getting that kind of service from a private company. It's very well done. Well, <laughs> we, we, we did. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. All right. Hi, I'm Angel Garcia Temecula. So my question is to Mayor Brown and Mr. Santana. Um, what do you believe is the best approach to handling or eliminating structural debt? I'm gonna be like Matt Lauer and say as quick as possible, please. <laughs> um, quickly spend less. Um, definitely assess what the long-term um, encumbrances of the de of the budget are and for instance um and i'll be quick as possible but no you don't really have there it's just, are it's a complicated issue. um structural deficits are are really interesting because they're usually um developed by the status quo and you have to be able to identify what in your system needs to be addressed in the short term and also in the long term to be able to eliminate that um, continual phenomena from happening and also definitely generating revenue. And I think that there's this misconception that governments can just cut their way out of any deficit, but you actually really have to generate revenue and sometimes you have to spend a little bit of money to do that. Um, so I think that those are just some of the things that we've been able to focus on and definitely stick to your own payment plans. Um, Cause you can put together this amazing plan to pay down your, your debt and also to spend less and to restructure how the city functions. But 
there has to be a continuity at the administrative level to be able to stick to that plan and also to be able to have um, continuity within the policymakers because as the comparison between Mayor Villagrosa and also Mayor Garcetti, there's one administration comes in, they're on one pathway, and then another election comes and there's another um, administration. And so those priorities can be lost in the translation and there's always a cost to um, really being able to catch back up and to be able to reassess the correct path to proceed forward. So those are just some of the issues that I find um, occurs at the government level just with the, the changing in um, key critical um, staff and, and chief administrators and also the, the political landscape is, is very volatile. And it can be volatile, but they have dire consequences. And uh, to answer your question, I think it's, it starts by just being honest about it, you know, and just whatever it is, you have to be honest about what it is. And it's, it's, it's actually not that hard. It's just projecting out what, where your revenue is going against your expenditures and showing what the gap is. And then you, having decisions that you make today put in the context of that gap and ask, asking the question, does it make it worse or does it make it better? And so, um, and then working backwards from that. And you know, when I shared a little bit about what my first year was like, the, one of the other things that we did is we did exactly that. We, we said, if, if we continue on the spending that we're on and the lack of revenue that we're confronting within the next few years, what was what we just got through with the five hundred million dollar deficit will be well over a billion deficit dollar deficit, and so that was people didn't like to hear that. It was just the honest, you know, said simple arithmetic as Bill Clinton once said, and and so once you know what that is, then you could start dealing with it and confronting it with it and being honest. There's not one simple answer. It's going to take a number of efforts to get there. And ensuring that you're making progress, you know, it's it's hard to get rid of a billion dollar deficit in a year. It's laying out in a plan. You have to you have to deal with it, chip at it year after year, and then finally be able to show what happens when the two lines actually meet and you actually have a surplus to make investments. So it's 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 being persistent, having a plan, being honest about what it takes, and and evaluating daily decisions against that. Just a question, you meant, did you say structural deficit or structural debt? Or I actually said that. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said hard. deficit. Just because I, I, I mean, I think this is a yeah. really great framework. I spent 10 years on the LA's Redevelopment Authority, and I think real, one of the really big problems with structural debt for cities is just bad deals, mm -hmm. bad agreements and failure to implement them and follow through with them. And you know, always on to the next, the politicians, unfortunately, even our best pol political leaders, they're always on to the next deal. And instead of all the deals that have been made that are not being implemented and uh, where revenue's not coming in or, you know, and so that's, you know, I think that's the basis for bad government. Bad debt is, the, is really about bad government. And, and the way that we do it as a city on the debt piece is, is we have a debt limit. So, you know, we have a general fund. Our debt should never exceed 6% of that general fund. That, that includes how much it costs to pay it off over a period of time. And so it's kind of, so it's a self-imposed credit limit that you have like on your own credit card, mm -hmm. right? And so it, 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 it allows us to contain it and it makes it clear that the credit card isn't a forever credit card. It, you actually have to make choices with your investments. and. As long and to stay within that self-imposed limit, that limit actually then helps your no different than your own FICA score. It actually helps our bond rating because if we have a responsible credit limit, then our bond rating is is reflected in that, and that then makes it easier for, for us to cheaper for us to borrow. So we have time for about one or two questions. So uh, right over here. Thank you all very much for your service. Uh, you t talked about, and I, I empathi empathize with poverty, with uh, homelessness, with uh, workforce development, but you haven't mentioned the big elephant in the room, a very inferior education system, which n none of those will be fully accomplished without much better education. Any thoughts there? Um, 
Yes, it, I think from the city's standpoint, most cities, their school district is separate from the actual governance structure. And so there is um, a lack of ability to be able to um, really get a handle of the decisions that are made at the district's level. However, I think just looking at the national landscape and the decline of our system-wide education is really a significant threat to America's prosperity. And I think that when we consider the school to prison pipeline and just the amount of money that we spend to incarcerate our juveniles instead of actually educate, educating them. And then looking at our public um, school system that really isn't um, fair and equitable because you can pay your taxes um, wherever you live and whatever school is closest to you or within your district, it may not be the same quality as a public school in another community. And so there are so many disparities in the education system and then in California specifically, um, we've had so many changes just in the last four years with the uh, metrics of, of success. And how do you, as a policymaker or even as a parent, your, your kids are, they're expected to perform, they're expected to succeed regardless of their circumstances. And so when you can't consider the, the issues that are within the home um, in comparison to the environment, and regardless if a kid's in foster care or they're homeless, they're still expected to meet the same achievement standards as kids that are um, within a two-parent household or that have ample incomes or everything that they need to succeed. There are kids that are living in poverty, below the poverty line in an astronomical amount uh, proportions, which is really quite embarrassing to a, a very affluent um, region that we live in, but it's really disheartening because kids are going to school hungry, and so how are they supposed to learn? So there, there's just so many different issues that are all rooted in poverty and, and really equity and justice. And I think that until um, education really becomes a priority for everyone, um, I don't really see the ability for our um, economy to be able to evolve and for the social issues that we continue to see as being systemic. We put mandates on everything and even focusing on um, housing or homeless or jobs, but at the end of the day, it, it's really about how do we um, educate our, our next generation because regardless of what it is that we do today, it's going to impact the nation and the, and the cities that we have tomorrow. And so um, I, I think about that issue all the time and um, I think that we as a nation, we have some big decisions to make. Um, when we compare ourselves to other um, affluent nations or um, developed nations, um, we, we have a, a lot of work to do. And I think that we're doing ourselves an injustice and we aren't considering what our tomorrow will look like if we don't consider education today, and especially in California. Thank you. Well said. All right, we have time for one brief last question. Uh, go ahead, ma'am. <coughs> Hi, Trisha Robbins, Cass, and Sherman Oaks. Um, my question's actually for you, Mr. Santana. You had uh, touched on briefly before in your comments um, the fact that LA is entering a time where it's again trying to uh, determine what it is and uh, reassessing what it is. And um, given some of the symptoms that we see of this, uh, things like the uh, na Neighborhood Integrity Initiative, uh, Build Better LA, um, uh, the uh, backlash in the press to the Mobility 2035 plan, um, I guess I want to ask how uh, personally you might see that uh, happening and uh, things that you're seeing at the city that are uh, uh, addressing that or starting to notice that or deal with it. You know, I, I think it's about actually leaning into the conflict as opposed to pretending that it doesn't exist and being honest about the trade-offs associated with these, uh, these issues. You know, there, there, is, there is something that Angelinos are giving up with density, right? There is a, uh, a, a certain lifestyle that, you know, we now see on what it used to be like on television or those of us who grew up here. And, and, th and being honest about that, but also being honest about the consequences of not pursuing um, a, different, a, a different vision for the city. And so by being honest about these issues, by not being afraid of the conversation and the conflict that it surfaces, then you could start mitigating those issues, right? As opposed to just letting it happen, right? And so, uh, you know, there can be density and a quality of life too. And 
There are many examples of cities around the world that have found that balance. Um, and so how do we ensure that you may, that there's still a public space to walk your dog and so that it's still safe, uh, that, that you're not sitting in traffic for two hours just to get to work, um, that there's an ability for you to breathe clean air. And so, and so those are trade-offs that have to be discussed and issues that need to be raised to ultimately get to, to um, I think, the outcome we all want to achieve. But too often, I think we're afraid to have it, the conversation, and so then people react to it, and it's done through initiative, or it's done through sort of a knee-jerk reaction as opposed to a more thoughtful, strategic way. We used to just fly kites and break them down. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. San Fernando Valley. All right, well, on that note, uh, we will wrap up. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you for coming out. Thanks to our KPCC in-person team. Thanks to all of you guys so much. Please come back to our KPCC in-person events and listen to us on 89.3 FM. We also have a booth over here where you can uh, record your thoughts on anything you want, anything. And uh, our panel is going to stick around. I think you know it can be easy to be sort of disillusioned at politics at the national level, but hearing from you guys is really inspiring. So I appreciate you uh, sharing this with our audience tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.